Uh, thank you, Jesse, for inviting me, and thank you all for being here. Um, I run the Urban Risk Lab, and like Jesse said, we work in Indonesia and Haiti and India and some places in the US, but for some reason, not here in Boston. And I'm hoping that today will change things and that we can um, meet with all of you and uh, start to prepare our city. Uh, we really work on connecting uh, government efforts with citizens' efforts and informing citizens and preparing them. We also really focus on the dual use uh, that Julie gave some examples to. So I'll, I'll skip this slide, but as we talk about um, sea level rise, we do current, constantly remind ourselves how Sandy could have shifted, and although it wouldn't have had the same consequences as New York, it would have really affected us. So one of the projects that we're actually working on uh, more in Portland and in conversations in San Francisco too is the idea of prep hubs, so emergency preparedness hubs. They're a new kind of infrastructure to desi designed to increase disaster resilience by activating neighborhood spaces with useful functions, really like these public spaces, and the hubs become community, community focal points for critical resources in case of an emergency. So the idea of a plaza, a public space, making them fun on the everyday with this kind of technology and then have them activate if something happens. So we're working on this in many different scales, but one is a sidewalk version, which can be integrated with, say, bus stops or put in public plazas next to subway stations. They are... They have several different functions to them. For example, one is a radio station that can play on the everyday, but then also if there is an emergency, you can get informed inf information directly from your city government. And I'll just take you through one of these examples. The other is power. Ch so we saw after Sandy that a lot of people were struggling to f power up their phones. And yet we all rely on our phones to get that immediate information. So this is an example where you can see the child pedaling and the mother looking at her phone. People always ask us, why don't you just add an extra solar panel onto it? But it's really this curiosity. We want people to come and engage with it on the everyday so that if something happens, they remember, oh, the power's out, but I can go charge my phone there. And everything is calibrated for this dual use. So for example, as you start pedaling, the lights turn on. And once you have a 5% charge, you get a rainbow. So on the everyday, kids love to race each other on this, and they're filling the battery for those of us who don't want to pedal to charge our phones. If an emergency happens, then this once you get a rainbow, it's a subtle acknowledgment of now you have 5% to make your important phone calls. Please step off and let the other people ride on it. So how we work. Um, we are speaking with the city of San Francisco and Portland, Oregon on this project. We really like to do community workshops so that part of it is really engaging people and having them understand, and really to the point where they can look at where their neighbors live, where the elderly live, so they understand their community uh, more. Um, we do our designing and fabrication in-house, and so we're able to make our own sensors, and this gives us a very quick way of adjusting things and inventing new things. Uh, and then we test it on the street. This is one test that we did in San Francisco. Um, we're working on larger versions of this too. So thinking of a whole park, what to do if everything goes down. Um, maybe you, we need to think about latrines. Maybe we need to think about water tanks and cooking stations. And so that they're thinking about these as modules that communities can add on, depending on what size of a site they have, allows us to be uh, create a network. So we've started thinking, what if this really creates a network throughout the whole city? This is a map similar to one, some of the maps that uh, Julie showed, but mapping the vulnerable populations, uh, the emergency shelters, and what the storm surge flood levels could be. And what if that does happen here? How do we prepare our people? How do we prepare ourselves? And how do we connect through all the various different ways. I know there are a lot of people here from the technology industry, so how do we connect all that to prepare ourselves? And how then can this really inform? If these prep hubs then change color and inform people to evacuate, maybe they become red. So that's the first project I wanted to show. And just to go through two quick other ones too. Um, one is a real-time flood mapping project that we're doing in several different countries and starting here in the US as well. 
Um, whenever there is a flood alert, it's usually for a very large area. And it's difficult to avoid this whole area because it's flooding. So what we realize, though, is that people are sharing very specific information with their friends on where this intersection is flooded. Don't go there. So what our platform does is it collects geospatial data about f from flood gauges um, within the city. That's real time. And then also collects information from the citizens, either through Messenger or Facebook, uh, Twitter. And then we put it on a platform. But instead of just collecting their information, we have a little conversation with them. So if someone says, "My f something flooded, we ask them, do you want to report a flood? If their bathroom flooded, they will ignore our little conversation. If it did flood, then they're asked to put, to get, put the location in. They're asked how high the flood waters are. They're asked to put a photo and then put in some text and submit the report. And what happens then is that it immediately goes to this public-facing map. So this, is, this has been launched in Jakarta in uh, January of this year. And all of these dots are people reporting. So you can say that they're unverified, but you see their photo and you see their comments. Now, when the government gets it, then they, the emergency managers, are able to highlight these districts. And so you can see in February uh, 21st of this year, there were tremendous floods in Jakarta. And thousands of people looked at our site, and even Uber drivers were using it to navigate different parts of the city. So you can avoid the floods. Here, it would be king tide, it'd be flash floods. We could avoid these places and keep people informed so they are not in harm's way. This is an image of within the control room in the emergency management district in, in Jakarta. And then now the deployment and the rescue is much quicker because all of this is happening real time and then information is real time. We're also trying to get people to start preparing. So this card starts to talk about if you know that it's hurricane season coming or in the, their case, monsoon season coming. If there's a culvert that has trash in it, report it and someone will come clean it up. One last project that I'd like to share to really think about preparing for sea level rise and integrating it with how we design our city, prepare for what transportation changes that we need to make. Um, we went through and looked at all of the different visualization platforms that there are now that show the consequences of sea level rise over the next 100 years. And they all end with, we're in trouble. What is it that we need to do next? So we've started creating this platform, um, working with Fadi Masood at the University of Toronto. We taught a studio together in the fall at Broward County. And so we've started having these conversations with them. The first part is the visualization of the flood mapping, right, along with everyone else. But then looking at other layers, like this is a layer that shows the age of the sewer lines. So again, talking about stormwater intrusion, Depending on how old your sewer lines are, you may want to start thinking about this too. And then mapping the real-time information from the flood gauges, uh, really looking at future land use patterns. So Broward County is looking at 2065, 2069, and they've put together plans for that. Then at that point, where is your lo site located? We really want to bring this down to the parcel level to inform individual house homeowners too. So in the same way that as a homeowner, you know in 30 years, I should be saving money to replace my roof. In 30 years, let's start thinking about what changes you may need to be making. We've also developed it so that if there's a developer coming and needs a larger site, then you are able to do a query over a larger site to understand what the issues are on those sites. And then this is interesting because Broward County has also started looking at how high their, her, their uh, groundwater will be at 2065. And that's this dotted line here. So if you are to make a park that's supposed to reserve and hold water, then you want to put it in a place where at 2065 it's not going to be not holding the groundwater. So again, being able to zoom into these very parcels and sites has been important to us as we're planning for the larger city. Oops, sorry, so I missed my last slide. Um, and what we're doing now is a lot of machine learning to understand how to put together 
not necessarily direct recommendations, but things that people can start doing. Start looking at financial incentives. Start looking at what kind of physical changes that they want to make on site. And we want this to be accessible to everyone, but we're talking to the city. We're going down in July and then meeting again in December about how much and what information gets released when and how the city wants to start having this conversation with the people. So again, for just to wrap up, I'm at zero minutes, um, that as we start planning both our transportation and city design, integrating that with informing people and making sure that we have both, if something happens, what do we do, but then how do we plan to reduce the impacts of that?